ICQ Podcast episode 428, ICQ Podcast Live. Well, hello fellow Amateur Radio enthusiasts and welcome to this, the 428th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast. Supported this episode by Pete Leng, Zulu Lima 4, Tanga Echo and our monthly and annual subscription donors. In this episode, we join Martin, M1RB, Dan, KB6, November Uniform, Karen, KD2, Golf Uniform, Tango, and Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike, November Golf, to discuss the latest Amatan Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BOY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a recap on the ICQ podcast live session held recently. Now, it's your wonderful support that continues to allow us to produce your uh, ICQ podcast and keep it advert free for you. And we'd like to thank uh, Pete Leng, Kilo Lima 4, Tango Echo for his one-off donation. And he, along with our monthly inscription donors, have basically paid for uh, the show today and kept us advert free, uh, paying our way on the internet. We run what's called the value for value model. It's a very, very simple concept. If you enjoy the show and you've got something from it, we ask you to uh, show your uh, generosity by visiting icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. Uh, select one of the options we have there for you to uh, show your appreciation and send it away. And everything you send goes towards, I say, paying our running costs and keeping everything uh, ticking along. Right, well, now we're going to head over and join Martin, Dan, Karen, and Edmund to discuss and generate thoughts about the latest Amazon radio news, including Hams Save Life in Dev Valley and ISS Debris Hits Home. As always, hope you enjoy. The ICQ Podcast. Getting it said for amateur radio. Well, hi guys, and welcome to this episode of the ICQ Podcast, episode 428, and tonight's news roundtable for that episode. Tonight, I'm joined by Mr. Dan Romanchek, KB6NU. Hi, Dan. Hi, Martin. Hi, uh, guys. Yeah, good to have you. Uh, also, your side of the pond, we have uh, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT. Hello, Martin, and hello to all of our listeners. Good to be back for another roundtable. Yeah, good to have you back. And I'm coming back to my side of the pond. We have Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. Hello, Martin. Hello, everybody. And Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP, we've let off for good behavior. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm joking. Ed's um, popped out uh, for a few days' break with his wife, so... Uh, have a good one, Ed, and we'll catch you again soon. Right, let's have a look and see what we've got in our, our news stories. Looking at this, Amateur Radio sir, saves family in Death Valley National Park. Now, th- to me, this is you know an interesting story. Um, Karen, I think you spoke more to the these people on this one, so I'll let you go first. Okay. Thank you, Martin. First of all, (laughs) of all the places for this to happen, something with a name like Death Valley, uh, you you don't have a good feeling about it, but it's a happy ending. This was a ham who was uh, camping with his family in Death Valley, which is a popular camping spot. And this is in Southern California. It's a desert area. Not great cell service, not great communication. So this ham, who'd only had his license for a few weeks, was wise enough to bring ham radio with him. But again, this was not a park activation. This was just family time. And the vehicle got stuck. They found that they couldn't leave. Now, I first encountered this story on a, on a, just a chat in a Discord server while it was happening. I, I saw a lot of hams responding saying oh my gosh there's a guy i just heard him on 10 meters he's in distress in death valley but i lost him to qsb these hams were in the midwest so they they were pretty far distance but they were listening on uh, 10 meters a few days later i i tried to track this down it was with no luck it's hard to find out much when you're in New York and you've only got a few flimsy details. But as it turns out, uh, the chain of command among hams is a ham tells a ham and a ham tells a ham and another ham tells a ham. And we all know how that goes. 
And Hams began tracking down uh, the the location where the guy's QTH is because they did hear his call sign. Uh, they called the police department in the city of San Diego where he where he has his QTH. Uh, they reached out to the parks officials, national parks officials. Little by little, uh, he was able to be uh, tracked down and assisted. And wow, this this is really what it's all about. So yeah, even if you're not activating a park, you never know. It always, always pays uh, to have a radio and and an antenna, and of course, uh, battery power with you if you're not hooking the radio up to the to the car. Happy ending, very happy ending. Um, and and a lot of a lot of teamwork from one club in particular in the Midwest, uh, so many miles away, the Black Swamp. Amateur Radio Club and the fellow I spoke with, Caleb Gustwiller, KD8TGB, who was one of many, many to take responsibility for helping this guy get to safety with his family. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I would uh, say it sounds um, what amateur radio is about. If all else fails, amateur radio is around and we get us out of trouble. Uh, so that's a good one. Dan, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, so I'd like to uh, sort of take the other uh, approach here and say, you know, when you are on the air, when you're on the air and listening, you know, be listening for uh, these kind of calls. They don't happen a lot, but uh, when they do, uh, you know, you'll be there and you'll be ready to uh, assist. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, keep your ears out for these kind of calls. Well, I'd agree with you, Dan, because I know uh, Chris Howard, uh, our Chris, was on Snowden and came across a lady who broke her ankle up on the mountain. And uh, he had his radio with him and um, put a couple of calls out. I know, I think the rescue team were already on their way, but, you know, it just proves these things do happen. And if if you're prepared, you know, your radio works pretty much everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Edmund, what's your thoughts on this subject? I first heard about this when it was already all over and I found out about it by reading messages in a Facebook group. Now, it wasn't a POTA Facebook group. I can't remember which one it was now, but reading down the chain of comments before I got to the comment at the very bottom, which said, it's all over, the the person concerned has been safe and well. The comments preceding that, when this was still a live incident, most of them were along the lines of, oh my goodness, I hope this person's all right, and can anybody else hear his transmissions, that kind of thing. But it was very noticeable that there was a minority of comments along the lines of, this sounds suspicious to me. It's probably not genuine. It's probably somebody hoaxing and comments of that nature. I would urge everybody listening to this, if ever you hear a mayday call or a call for help, irrespective of what band it is, irrespective of what mode it is, your default position must be that it is genuine unless or until it is proven otherwise. So it doesn't matter if you've heard 99 calls for help in a row that have all been hoaxes, even if you have, that doesn't speak at all about whether the 100th call is genuine or not. So if you ever hear one, Never, ever assume, even if you're highly suspicious, never, ever assume that it's a hoax. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I agree with you, Edmund. And it's important that uh, we do treat them all sensible. And if it's deemed as a hoax, obviously the powers that be will sort it afterwards. We can only uh, do what we can do. That good news, it all ended up safe and well for everybody. Right, let's move to our next news story. NASA confirms the ISS debris hit a Florida home. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, we often talk about space junk, especially this group. We seem to uh, 
get a lot of uh, space junk uh, stories. Dan, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, you know, the, the, this really kind of is amazing because the, the chances of this happening are really pretty small. But to sort of laugh about it, but it's just it's it's just amazing that it happened at all. I mean, I suppose. I suppose NASA certainly is kind of to blame on this. I mean, they should never have jettisoned all that junk out of there uh, without without thinking twice about it anyway. But man, what, I mean, what the chances are so small. It's just I'm just still amazed by it. Yeah, you're damn right. It, it's the, the statistically, it's so small uh, that you're going to get hit with anything. But if you're the one person whose house it's hit. <laughs> you're gonna be pretty upset about it. And oh I yeah, be. for sure. And for unfortunately, nobody was hurt here. I mean, that, I mean, it would have been more, a lot worse, right? If I mean, there was one of the one of the children was in the house at the time. If you know that person had been injured, that would have made it a lot worse. Certainly would have done. And I remember Ed saying a couple about four weeks ago that at one point in time they thought uh, a large portion of space junk from the ISS was going to hit southern germany so uh yeah bit, bit, bit of a worry bit of a worry karen i know space junk is one of your uh, uh hobby horses but what do you think about this one space junk the junk the junk we love to hate yes uh, this this is a bizarre and an uncommon thing of course as as dan pointed out uh and in fact the first time I heard about this story, I didn't pay attention to it because, well, I thought it was a, a hoax or at least a, a misplaced claim. There was a news item in which a homeowner uh, was said to be uh, claiming that the debris had hit his home. And I thought, well, that's his claim. We don't really have it confirmed. So till it's confirmed, it's not a story. So I kind of sat on it, and that was the decision at the time, and I, I monitored, and sure enough, no hoax, no hoax. This is the real deal. It was a portion of, uh, I think it was the mount for the batteries. It wasn't one of the batteries itself, but part of the pallet that the batteries were on. Damaged the ceiling, damaged the floor. Um, the homeowner himself, the gentleman, was away on vacation and I believe he he discovered it when when he came home and of course NASA did their analysis of it and confirmed yes indeed well my feeling is no it shouldn't be hitting homes it shouldn't be hitting populated areas but you know we shouldn't be dumping it in the ocean either we're we're garbaging up everything we're garbaging up the skies again that's another matter altogether but bottom line i guess you can say it's a happy ending because no one was hurt and homes can be repaired but i i wish we would would stop being uh, <laughs> uh the garbage pail for the galaxy it's it's getting very tiresome to hear about space junk <laughs> back to you martin yeah yeah i hear what you're saying and now, mentioning space junk, I suppose we do cover it quite a lot here, but it's a shame that we have to, I think. Edmund, what's your thoughts? Well, this is one of these low probability but high impact if it happens to you personally type scenarios. So I hope that NASA will indemnify the homeowner against the cost of this if his household insurance either refuses to pay out or does pay out, but then puts up uh, his renewal premiums next time round. And it was very lucky because even if, even if I was standing in the middle of a field, I wouldn't want this to land close to me because presumably it would be travelling at high speed. It would also be very hot having scrapes against the friction of coming through our, our atmosphere. So even if it didn't hit you or your house, if it landed near you, you could be injured by shrapnel, I guess, and who knows what chemicals might be on it. So 
I think NASA were quite lucky because, as has been said, if this had landed and knocked somebody on the head or uh, hit their house, which then started a, a catastrophic fire that burnt the house down, then the, uh, the the negative publicity in the mainstream media would have been a lot, lot worse, wouldn't it, Martin? So hopefully not a sign of things to come. Yeah, I do hope it's not a sign of things to come, but you're dead right. But it's an interesting one. We have to uh, well, be fair about it and mentioning it. And I think uh, I think people at NASA have got to realise they can't just throw their rubbish out. It's going to go somewhere. I also think the house owner should buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, next news story. Program for disabled amateurs marks 57 years. So they've been going for 57 years. Now, I have heard of uh, uh, Handy Ham's cat uh, and I'm going to pass this one to Karen first because it's a US story again. What do you think of it? It's, it's a brilliant achievement. This is an amazing achievement, uh, Martin, and it shows, first of all, well, it's proof positive amateur radio is for everybody. And it should be for everybody. And especially now that we have more sophisticated technology to give people access to the different modes of amateur radio, there's no reason why anyone wanting to be a ham should feel that there are obstacles getting in their way. This is a fabulous organization. I, a ham I grew up with was for a long time, would, would fly to the Midwest and be a coach at the summer camp for kids. He himself um, being a disabled amateur. And so he well understood the, the meaning that this gives uh, to people's lives to be able to do this. I mean, we, we know what it means to us and, and we who are more or less able-bodied imagine having what's considered a disability or obstacle getting in the way of maybe hearing hearing the code or, or being able to see uh, the waterfall on the screen. All of this, teaching people how to use adaptive technology and learning the basics, learning the basics of being a good radio operator, because that's part of it too, you know, learning, learning to test for the exam and then learning to be a, a courteous and effective operator. This wonderful program has brought so much joy to people and opened up so much opportunity. I wish them another 157 years. They are going to have a QSO party marking the achievement of 57 very good years, and they will be on the air for 48 hours, uh, beginning Friday, the 26th of April at 1900 UTC, and they will continue through Sunday, the 28th of April at 1900 UTC. All modes, all bands, and yes, digital and VOIP will, will be included. So be listening and and uh, share in the uh, share in the uh, congratulations and the good wishes. Uh, they'll be calling CQ Handy Ham fifty seven. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, well, that's a good one. And to say Handy Ham, I have listened to some of their podcasts. Really, really good. Very, very informative. Edmund. Without spoiling what's happening at the end of uh, this show, uh, you and I are operating on the 27th. Do you reckon we might get a chance to uh, get a contact with them? Well, we might. And the fact that it's a QSO party rather than a contest increases our chances because that means that uh, they will be workable or they can operate on the walk bands as well. How much do you want me to give away about what's happening on the 27th, Martin? Well, whatever you want to, mate. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm the, I'm the uh, gopher on this one. <laughs> okay, well, the 27th is International Marconi Day. So on that day, I will be um, at a location that has considerably better antennas than, than I do at home. So I will certainly listen out for them and... 
over half a century of anything is one heck of an achievement. So uh, very many congratulations to all who are involved. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And uh, as I say, all jesting aside, I should be helping Edmund on that day as well. Dan, have you come across Handy Hams or ever listened to any of their podcasts? Well, I have uh, talked to some on the air for sure, and uh, I just agree with the rest of you that it's a it's a really a wonderful organization. It has helped lots and lots of uh, uh, handicapped hams, and is worthy of support. Uh, you know, you were talking about the podcast. I happened to look it up, and it looks like they discontinued the podcast in June of 2022. So that's probably why you haven't heard it heard one recently. Yeah, that's a shame because they were very, very informative, and yeah, you know, I, I used to enjoy listening. I picked the old one up every now and again, which I thought was really, really good. So yeah. Anyway, best of luck, guys. Uh, Handy Hams, great organisation. Right. Our next news story. The headline says ESRG uh, March 2024 key messages. What does that mean? Well, actually, ESRG is Exam and Syllabus Review Group uh, at the RSGB. So they've been working on new questions for the new question pool. Edmund, do you want to go first on this one? Well, I don't really know what to say about this, Martin. Um, I attended online the RSGB annual general meeting the Saturday before we recorded this, and I may have not been paying 100% attention at the moment and missed it, but I don't remember this being mentioned at all. Um, the only thing to do with exams that kind of stuck in my brain was there was a discussion about publishing the questions in advance, a bit like happens in the States. And would that open the possibility of somebody just memorizing all the questions and all the answers to be able to pass the exam by rote effectively? without actually understanding anything. And the answer that came back to that was, if you understand the subject enough to be able to memorize all the questions and all the answers, you probably can't pull off that feat of memory without understanding or without having a level of understanding. But um, beyond that, Martin, I don't, don't really know what to say about this. Sorry. No, no, it's fair. It's fair. And what you've raised is also fair. I mean, I, tr I taught the guy foundation and intermediate. I'm not going to give you his call sign, uh, but he has Asperger's. And you could give him the book, and he would tell you what the sentence was on page 49, paragraph 3, sentence 4, and, he, and he'd be able to quote it almost word for word. Uh, and he knew all the answers. You could quiz him all day long and uh, the answers to the exam. But he had no comprehension. And that's a shame. Now, fortunately, he's just become an operator. He doesn't fiddle with things outside of his skill set. When I was teaching him um, in the UK, the brown wire is live. And uh, we were talking about it. And I said, what colours the... Um, what colour's the earth cable? And the earth cable in the UK is green and yellow. And he'd say, it's brown. No, it isn't. And I explained why, well, yeah, yeah. What colour's the earth cable? Brown. And I'd say, no, it isn't. I said, why do you think it's brown? He said, well, it's dirt colour, isn't it? That was his idea. So not knocking, there are people. There's always going to be somebody who could do it. Uh, there won't be that many. Having sat all three of the American exams in one day, and that I know you publish the questions in advance, guys, you can't remember nearly two and a half thousand questions. You can't remember the answers to two and a half thousand questions if you don't know know how to do it, because there are a number of questions that are very, very similar. Dan, I think, do you agree with me or not? Actually, first off, no, no one. Real, not too many people, anyway, take all three in one day. 
and a lot of people do just memorize the the answers but having said that just like you mentioned i i don't i don't think you can you can, you can't not learn anything if you if even if you're just memorizing the questions right i mean some of it's going to stick with you and when you have to dredge that bit of knowledge up you're going to remember it because you memorized it you know so so i i'm not, i'm not so um, down on actually memorizing questions and not only that this is another thing i say you know especially on the technician class test i would say that and i i haven't done an exhaustive study i probably should i would say that at least half the questions you have to memorize the answers to get it correct anyway you know you have regulations questions and you have you know operating procedure questions there, there's no way you can can you know make a calculation to get the correct answer for those you have to memorize the answer that that's just the way our our exams are structured so i you know i don't i'm not so such a big uh, stickler about memorizing the answers well yeah I, I understand where you're coming from and yeah there are there are always questions that are have to have a de definitive answer um yeah I, I suppose I'm a terrible person to be in, to, to interview others because I don't ask I don't ask questions that are have a definite answer. I like to see how people's brains work, uh, but for, for for an exam, you obviously do have to have exact answers. And where I was going is some of the maths questions; they're very very similar, but they have different answers and if you remember the wrong if you were to try and remember all of them you'd probably get a few of them wrong but uh, others as you rightly say dan where the band edges or whatever you've got to know that otherwise uh, or you've got to memorize that but there's it's courses for courses karen have we waffled on a bit too long and left you anything to say Oh, yes, you've left me something to say. Of course, you always do. You usually do. <laughs> My stance on this has changed over time. I used to really not like memorization. And of course, that's how I got when I tested for my, my technician. That's how I did it. I basically memorized everything. But for my general, I took a course. I also studied the questions. But by the time I, I sat for the general a couple of weeks later, my curiosity was sufficiently piqued that I, I not only wanted to know the answer, I wanted to know why this was the answer. And I think that's the important thing, that once you get your ticket, you you have kind of a fire has been lit in you where you want to know more. And, and I think that's, that's certainly in the spirit of amateur radio. I'm not a fan of, of going in mechanically and, and taking a test that way. But as uh, Dan, I think uh, you rightly pointed out, regulations, <laughs> there's no calculations involved. You have to know the regulations. Edge of the band, there's no calculation involved you have to know these are things you need to have a recall of in your mind and the only way to do that is memorization for goodness sake anybody who's ever learned a foreign language has had to memorize the endings for the verb conjugations that's just the way it is so i think ideally it it should be a mix of the two memorization with comprehension but Am I ashamed of, of having gone in with, with a head full of questions memorized for my technician exam? I used to be. Yeah, I used to be. I, I wouldn't tell people that I went in like, like a trained, <laughs> trained animal and just sat down and, and filled out the questions. I'm not ashamed of it now because I know that what, what it did do for me, the end result was it made me want to learn why why the answer was the answer and and that may that may be the way to do it to have a combination of the two back to you martin yeah good good comments there and yeah i think i think we've, we've said this before is when you learn to drive you don't learn to drive you learn to pass the driving test and then afterwards you learn to drive 
And it's the same with amateur radio in that there is a lot going on. There's a lot of different things. And it is technical. Uh, but the beauty of our hobby is there are enough people around that you can ask questions and get some some really good answers back. And I know I keep coming back to our digital talk group, which isn't that busy, but I've had some great conversations with people who've yeah, explained things to me and vice versa and asked questions. So, you know, that's what our hobby's about. Once you've got the... Uh, got the, your ticket then um, it's a learning curve so the guys at the rsgb yeah fine get your new questions out there get the new syllabus out and let's see what happens right moving to our next new story and i'll be honest with you i thought this was a april fall when i first saw it i thought definitely an april fall and then Amateur Radio Newsline run run the, the article, and I thought, well, it can't be if they've run it. But the headline is, Hytera Communications banned from worldwide sales of two-way radios. And it's uh, supposedly the FCC have banned, got the radios banned uh, worldwide. And I'm thinking, how can you do that? But it's one of those things, I think, where it's going to be commercial. So, Karen, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, I should clarify, uh, this is not an FCC act. This was a United States federal court, and it was uh, based in Illinois, in one of the federal districts in Illinois. So this was a judge uh, doing this. It the headline was very weird when I first saw it, and and I showed the story to Ed DD five LP, who uh, is our able copy desk <laughs> for uh, for Newsline, and to whom I'm very grateful because he raises questions and asks some hard questions too. And we both agreed it was a little strange that I mean the United States court their jurisdiction ends at the boundaries of the United States. We, we do not rule the world, much as maybe some people might, might think our, our powers do not go that far. So what's going on here? Uh, well, what's going on here is that there, there are divisions of uh, Hytera based here in the States. And so uh, with Motorola also being based in Illinois, the action takes place there in the court. and that's in effect shutting down the global trade that's that's what it's it's doing because uh this is a long running trademark uh and copyright uh, infringement because of the software and the motorola technology now a development in recent days shows that uh, not only is, is Hytera challenging this, surprise, surprise, there is a daily fine of $1 million uh, that's been, uh, the court has put against Hytera. Uh, each day they do not comply with this court order. Uh, they've got to pay, they've got to pay the piper uh, $1 million. So Hytera, uh, just as an update, has asked an appeals court to halt this injunction and is uh, wanting to stop the fine as well. That's a lot of money. You can buy a lot of radios, especially high terrors. <laughs> this is not likely to be resolved anytime soon, but it, you know, it, for me, uh, as a, a person who enjoys DMR occasionally, especially when HF is not cooperating, what's this going to do uh, to DMR? Uh, with so many of the Motorola and the Hytera radios in in use there, not to mention elsewhere. So stay tuned, stay tuned. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, interesting points you raised. And in fairness, having programmed well, a while ago, because uh, I used to work for a, a dealer, having programmed Motorola's and Hytera's, they are far more complicated to set up for DMR because they have far more options available for the commercial market. 
the DMR we tend to have in the DMR we have in, in amateur effectively is a cut down subset and you can't do half the things you could on say a, a Motorola or a high tier, but we don't need them in amateur radio. But if this kicks further in, is this going to affect other um, manufacturers of DMR radio? Well, that's, that's another question. Dan, what's your thoughts? Well, I, I think that the the case here is mostly the use of Motorola intellectual property. If I recall correctly, there were some engineers that worked for Motorola that then sort of jumped ship and went over to Hytera. So th- this is really a sort of a, and, and they took, they took, st- stuff with them you know they use technology that they developed by under motorola and, and applied it to itera so itera didn't pay the the price for that intellectual property and you know all these all these kind of cases are always very complicated i'm certainly no legal expert but in a way i'm kind of glad to see that motorola is prevailing on this because you know it's just it's just wrong right it's just wrong that you know some company should be able to uh just steal the technology like that so so i'm i'm sort of with motorola on this one yeah yeah i i I hear what you're saying and in fairness you know when i was uh working for a dealer i must admit the high tier equipment was well made, good quality in the bits and pieces, and a reasonable price, not far off of the Motorola kit in price. So therefore, you know, I'm surprised Hytera haven't licensed some of the uh, information that uh, Motorola wanted to keep taking them to court for. But we'll see. Edmund, what's your thoughts on this? You, I know you got DMR. Well, I've actually used. Motorola handsets at work in our old building, um, security and incident marshals. And I, I was the fire marshal for a while. We used Motorola UHF DMR handsets. Now that we've moved to a new building, they have been replaced with guess what? Hytera <laughs> handsets. And I've not actually used one. But I've seen them at a distance, and I concur with what Martin said. They do look, you know, solid, well-built pieces of kit. So I'm not biased in that sense. But the the first thought that crossed my mind when I read this is, given that presumably Motorola and Hytera equipment is available worldwide rather than just in the United States, how would this work in practice because presumably any court in the u.s only has jurisdiction over u.s territory so yeah i'm not sure how this is going to pan out martin yeah i think what will happen edmund is that if you if you stick them a million dollars a day in the states that's effectively going to shut high tier down in the states and then if it follows around the world, the, the the trade will drop off. So it's a trade thing, and lots of countries won't want to upset the US. Some will deliberately upset the US. We know this to be the case. But it, it'll be, a, it, uh, I suppose, and we were kicking this around earlier, I suppose it will be done on trade sanctions and things like that. So interesting. But as I say, hopefully it won't screw the DMR side of amateur radio up to at all. But uh, if you do get a chance to get a second-hand uh, high tier or a Motorola for that instance, and I used to have um, a couple of Motorola's, they're very, very well built and very, very good fun to use. Right, last news story and... Once again, I've got a little bit of background history on this, but Ham's effort helps shed light on the solar eclipse. Now, we've talked about uh, the solar eclipse here, and it's great news. Ed, 
WX2R, emailed me today and said thank you to all the listeners and ICQ podcast people who have publicised what they're doing and we, they really help us. So, uh, Edmund, I know that you were doing things on this. What do you think? Well, I'm pleased that there was a way for people outside of the US to be involved. My personal involvement was both transmitting and receiving whisper on the 15 meter band because from here the second and third hops uh, could be affected by the eclipse and whilst I haven't been able to draw any conclusions from my results in isolation all of that will have fed into WhisperNet uh, so hopefully academics and researchers and people with far more brain cells than me can look at the big picture and draw conclusions about propagation. But it was good fun. And I ran Whisper at 5 watts, which was the lowest I could turn my IC7300 down to, uh, on the 15 metre band, using my 40 metre inverted V as a three half wavelengths antenna. And uh, incidentally, if you've got a 40 metre dipole that's fed with coax in the middle you can tune it on 15 meters and it does actually seem to work very well uh, or my one does at least better than you might imagine so it's definitely worth having a go and i was on the air from sunday morning through to tuesday evening which meant i was feeding data in for the two normal days both sides of the the eclipse so yeah good fun as i say and as far as whisper goes if you own one of the whisper light transmitters or equivalent it's very easy and tempting just to use that all the time and transmit but not receive but whisper only works because there are people out there who receive the whisper transmissions as well as, you know, merely sending them out. So if you have the possibility to receive whisper as well as transmit it, then for an event like this, or even just from time to time, it's well worth contributing, uh, for want of a better way of putting it, by receiving whisper and uploading your results to the internet so that everybody else can see them rather than purely transmitting it all the time doing nothing but transmission using a whisper light or something every single time is a habit that it's quite easy to fall into and something that i'm guilty of martin well don't feel guilty others do it as well mate <laughs> uh, but uh, good you took you sent your login on that one Karen, this uh, solar eclipse, did it much happen your part of the world and were you involved? Oh, yes. Well, uh, we had 90%, 90% eclipse here. We were not in the path of the total eclipse, but 90, we'll take 90%. It was exciting. We did go outside here at the QTH to watch. I did have the rig on. In fact, I made a... Uh, a, a couple of CW contacts. The band behaved oddly, which is fine. I made one contact on, nearby on a band that I normally cannot get near contacts on. So I believe it was 20 meters. I got a very short distance contact and then uh, changed bands and made a contact with a fellow in France where well, that was kind of a contrast in uh, from from local to DX. I will say it was really heartening to see people get excited about this. I was looking at people just in general walking around on the street or in their leaving their houses and not even bothering to stop and consider what's going on in in the in the universe. As the sky got darker, I heard the birds get very vocal, as if they were telling one another, it's, it's time to go back to your nest. 
nature changed a bit. And I know at some of the zoos, the zookeepers were watching for odd behavior of the animals. Uh, like like the ionosphere, uh, the animals also change their behavior somewhat. The squirrels, which you know I was watching, they couldn't care less. They just went about their business. But the, it was interesting to see birds, uh, birds respond to that. I liked the opportunity to be on the air, uh, and I hope that some of my QSOs will be gathered into the big data crunching. I think this was an, an amazing effort on the part of HamSci, and I think the months ahead are going to yield interesting data, not just from this eclipse, but comparing it to the annular eclipse of last year and the prior total solar eclipse, which, as I recall, was, uh, 20, I think it was 2017. So we still have a lot to learn, but I think this is going to fill in a lot of the gaps and we're going to maybe surprised what we hear. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, some good information there, Karen. And yeah, you don't always think, we, because we are into amateur radio, we're interested in what's going on in amateur radio, but you don't always think about what effect it has on animals. I spoke to another gentleman um, on the talk group the other day, and he was telling me how in the States uh, they were set up for an emergency group just in case the phone systems went down and all sorts of bits and pieces. And you say, well, why would it go down? But if everybody and his dog are out watching the um, solar eclipse and they all want to transmit, uh, use their phone at the same time, poor cell towers are going to roll over. Anyway, that's another one. Uh, now, Dan, I know you've been to see these guys in the past, um, but what do you think about the current uh, Hamsai event? Oh, I, th I think they did a bang-up job, as uh, others have said here. They were really very organized, and um, yeah, they were great. Personally, I th I kind of missed the boat on this one, personally. Uh, I lived very close to the totality uh, uh, area, and I decided not to go see it. And uh, But a bunch of my friends did, a bunch of my friends and acquaintances. And it was 98.5% here in Ann Arbor. And yet, even so, you think, oh yeah, that's you know that's enough, and it was pretty impressive. But after hearing their stories, I I just should have gone because I did, wouldn't have had to drive that far to 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 see it. I did manage to operate uh, during the eclipse. Uh, did uh, some of the solar eclipse QSO party and submitted my logs, so I did uh, I did participate in that way. But yeah, like I say, I kind of missed the boat on not seeing the the, the big uh, the big show. Well, at least you put a log in, Dan, which is the important one. But as I say, shame we missed it. Um, and sometimes you have to make a decision, and we can't always get it right. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. <laughs> I wish I had more of it, quite honestly. But yeah, know what you mean, Dan. Know what you mean. Right, well, that concludes our news stories. Let's find out what the guys have been up to uh, since our last uh, chat. Karen, ladies first. Okay, first of all, and in no, no particular order, but in this case, in importance, the ICQ Live event, our first that we had a few days ago. Want to thank everyone on, on behalf, especially on behalf of Ed DD5LP, uh, who isn't here today, uh, but really appreciate the enthusiasm over this. And uh, there will be an opportunity to hear this uh, in the program elsewhere. So uh, hoping for more, hoping for more in the future, hoping, hoping to get a lot more folks engaged in this. It's a good way to get to know our listeners, a wonderful way to get to know one another a little better. So thank you for that. On a personal level here, uh, two things two things I've been involved in. Uh, one was the big worldwide event, World Autism Awareness, Whiskey 2 Alpha. Uh, many, many operators in this, thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, QSOs made logged a good good team to work with it's always fun being part of a special event team and as you know i love special events so uh world autism awareness uh, happened 
and we're still counting still counting the logs but the numbers the numbers are good the other thing was i did activate a new park for me comset state park up on the north shore uh, managed to get some nice dx even though the bands were not cooperating as well as they normally would be for an early in the day activation so uh POTUS season is upon us this was once again sadly car pota and i'm determined that cold or no cold outside i'll, I'll put on a thick jacket and get myself out there because um uh, Portable radio belongs on a picnic bench. It doesn't belong in the back seat of an SUV. So we're slowly getting there. That's it for me, Martin. Back to you. Well, that sounds great, and you've been having fun. And uh, uh, when it comes to Edmund in a minute, I know he's done, done a poacher as well because <laughs> I was with him. But yeah, there you go. Uh, Dan, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Well, as uh, Karen says, poda season is upon us. And not to glow too much, but I went uh, a couple of days ago and it was 70 degrees and uh, I did sit at a picnic table and the, the bands were lousy. I, I will have to say that the bands were lousy and I didn't, but I did manage to scratch out a, a dozen contacts, you know, including some, and this was odd, you know, you mentioned the uh, DX contacts. I made 12 contacts and four of them were DX contacts on 15 meters. Which uh, I don't know. It, it just weird things were happening with the with the propagation and or activity levels. Other than that, uh, I've got a I received a QMX kit, a QRP Labs QMX kit. Haven't quite started on that yet, but I've uh, I'm hoping to get that done certainly by the end of the summer, so I can take it out on Poda. And uh, what else? Uh, still still beating on the the extra class study guide. Uh, hopefully, I'll. I even have some uh, some uh, copies by Dayton, but uh, it's looking less and less likely. But that's it. Back to you. Well, sounds like you've been having fun, and uh, um, we, we could be in danger of becoming the uh, the Potter podcast. Hi, <laughs> hi. But uh, because I think we're all enjoying it uh, so much now, Edmund, what have you been up to since um, we last did a podcast? Put it that way. Well, I've done my first ever poter from the South Downs National Park, reference Golf Bravo 0265, and it was on 70 centimetres FM, 19 contacts altogether. Um, even though it was a poter, the main motive for doing it was the 433 Alive activity afternoon, aimed to get a bit of... Um, activity on 70 centimeters fm martin came along and kept me company which was nice now in the last edition of the podcast which obviously i wasn't taking part in martin mentioned that in this edition i, I would tell you a little story about a radio i bought do, do you remember mentioning that martin i did so go ahead yeah. well Back in March, Martin and yours truly attended the Dover Radio Rally. And on the stall next to us, amongst other things, there was a small mobile radio on sale for £10. And I thought it looked a bit lonely sitting there, so I bought it. The radio is quite old and it covers 70 centimetres only uh, 35 watts high power officially although i think due to its age these days it puts out a lot less than that um, it's clearly a radio of a certain vintage it's made by aoi or adi i'm not quite sure from reading the, the logo uh, model number alfa romeo 446 and part of my reason for buying it was that i knew that seven days later on Easter, no, six days later, on Easter Saturday, 433 Alive was happening. So I thought for £10, I mean, what can you buy for £10 these days? For £10, I'll take a chance. And if it works, which it did, I'll take it with me up to this, uh, this high ground just outside Storrington. And I will use that for 433 Alive. And 
that's exactly what I did, and it worked perfectly. And uh, it worked so well that Martin even made a few contacts on it while sitting inside my car. So far, so good. Nothing particularly unusual about anything I've said so far. But, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say that the world is very, very small. Well, if you ever doubt that, here's a true story that proves that the world is indeed very, very small. On this high ground in the car park we were in, there were a lot of walkers because Chantry Post, our location, sits on the South Downs Way, which is very popular with walkers, cyclists, horse riders. So I'd made a few QSOs and I was sitting there drinking my coffee, gazing into the distance, not really paying attention. And Martin spotted somebody walking towards him who he recognised. So Martin waved and this person came over along with his wife and they were kitted out with walking gear. They were clearly walking along there because they were walking the South Downs way. They didn't have any radio gear on them at all. I didn't recognise them. As far as I was concerned, they were just like any other random members of the public. And Martin said to me, do you recognise this gentleman? And I said, no. And I was thinking to myself, should I? And it turned out that this chap who I didn't recognise was the man who six days earlier had sold me the radio that I was using for that poter activation. So I live in West Sussex. The, the rally was in Dover in Kent. The chap who sold me the radio lives in Croydon, I think you said, Martin, didn't you? So all of these three places are tens of miles apart. So statistically, the chances of that happening, you know, him, the person who sold me the radio, being up there, not just in the same place, but at the same time, you know, was I, I couldn't believe it. I still can't quite believe it. And I said to him, you remember you sold me that radio last weekend? Yeah. Well, if you stick your head in through my car window, the radio that I'm using from up here is the very device that you sold me. How about that, Martin? I should have bought a lottery ticket, shouldn't I? You should have done, mate. You very well should have done. And as my witness, I'm not making that up because you were there and you saw it, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a good one, the jazz say. The uh, the gentleman doesn't live terribly far from me, but the, uh, so t- uh, the POTUS summit where we were, when I drove up to it, I thought this the road was getting poorer and poorer and poorer, and I'm thinking it isn't going to be long before I need a, a Land Rover or something really serious off road vehicle. I'm thinking there'll be nobody there, and I get to the top of this uh, and it opens out into a car park, and there's over thirty cars there. Unbelievable. Yeah, so a good day was was had by all. Looking to the future, the only thing in the very near future is Saturday the twenty seventh of april uh, which is international marconi day now this is going to be a a big one because this year is the 150th anniversary of his birth and even now there are several italian special event stations on the air all the way through to the end of april celebrating marconi's birthday and uh, if you work enough of them you can apply for an award and that kind of thing but that, that's a separate setup. International Marconi Day is from midnight till 23.59 on Saturday the 27th, the nearest Saturday to his birthday. So Amberley Museum in West Sussex is going to be on the air. We're not going to be using the call sign that we use for the other 364 days of the year. International Marconi Day, we use the call sign Golf 2 November Mike, G2NM, which these days is a club call sign. However, in decades gone past, it was the personal call sign of Gerald Marcuse, who uh, 
around about the turn of the 1930s, was an RSGB president. He was very involved with the setting up and establishing of Empire Broadcasting, and he also worked uh, for the Marconi Company and at Amberley Museum. We've got quite a lot of his uh, personal papers and records um, on display. So G2NM, the one time per year it'll be on the air. Um, we're going to be on HF. We'll be doing voice modes, SSB, rather than CW um, or digital modes. Probably be on the air from roughly 10 o'clock local time uh, through until, well, as as late as we can stay and until the museum locks up for the day, I guess. Um, we do have several different antennas, so 40 metres through our tuned doublet is normally the band of choice. However, if there's a lot of QRM from the other museum exhibits and that can go up and down from occasion to occasion uh, or if the upper hf bands are open we do have uh, a two element beam as well for four, uh, for 20 15 and 10 meters uh, which is quite good for going transatlantic <laughs> if propagation is on our side so that's the plan so i will definitely be there and the other part of the plan is that uh, your good self martin you are planning to, to come down and, and operate, aren't you? Well, I certainly am. I certainly am I'm intending to spend the day with you, so I'm looking forward to that too. Well, look forward to that, Martin, and uh, that's it. All right. Well, that's a good one. That's a good one, and I'm glad you you you've, you've, you told the story because it was yeah um, almost an unbelievable uh, coincidence. And, uh, yeah, for Karen and Ed's uh, – sorry, for Karen and um, – Dan's uh, thing. Yeah, I went and I worked five 433 stations, uh, UHF stations were up there. In fairness, when you park next to somebody, you can't be operating 70 SEMs and them operating 70 SEMs. So I took um, a little HF rig. Uh, I made, I worked seven countries from up there as well on HF and spent a fair amount of time chatting to the local public, which, uh, I always think it's fun and something we should do more of. Now, what have I been up to? Uh, well, I've spent time doing the smart radio, and that that uh, was a couple of weeks ago we did it on. Um, we've got another one this weekend, so we're doing uh, number seven of this week. Also, I've done a little bit of operating. Uh, I worked a couple of the Marconi stations last weekend uh, down there in Italy. Not not a great distance from the UK, but great fun. I do mention the ICQ podcast talk group, and as Karen said, we run ICQ live last Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, weren't many people turned up, but they lost our game. Two countries I saw on the talk group the today that have actually called through, which I'm sure some of you would have liked to have got. How about Thailand? And the other one was Brunei. Now, I think Brunei is a new one to the group, but there is a couple of people I've spoken to in Thailand. So, you know, don't dispel. If you're going to connect, put a call through. And, you know, it's not the busiest of talk groups in the world, but there's lots going on down there. And the other thing I've been doing, my next door neighbour, he's a member of an off-road club, and they go out and their Land Rovers, well off-road sort of places where most cars won't go to. And he, they, they run radio, but uh, not amateur radio, the commercial stuff. And he came round the other day with a couple of radios and asked if I'd look at them for him. In fairness, they were like 30-year-old uh, PMR rigs which had been bashed to smithereens. One I got working, the other one, both the volume control and the squelch control disintegrated completely. They'd just fallen apart through probably bad use. And as I had to say to him, the chances are you can't just fit any old volume control squelch in these because of the way the case is and the size. And because they're like 30 years old plus probably, you just won't be able to get them. So anyway, got one working. 
and one is had to write off. But I, that did give me a, a bit of fun in the afternoon playing, putting these radios together. So that's what I've been up to. Fair bit of operating for me and uh, a lot of fun. So, guys, all that's left for me to do is thank you guys for turning up and uh, we can continue with the rest of the podcast. I'd like to thank Mr. Dan Romachek, KB6NU. Well, thank you, Martin. As always, it's been a blast. Yeah, it's been fun, isn't it? I'd like to thank Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT. Thank you, Martin. We covered a lot of ground this week. Uh, All of it good. Yeah, we always do. I'm getting much better. I get your call sign right every time now. You know what I have to do now? I've got to change my call sign. Got to keep you on your toes, Martin. You've got to (laughs) keep me on my toes, yeah. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. Thanks for joining us, Edmund. Unfortunately, it looks like Mr. Edmund Spicer's internet's given up on him, so uh, no problems. I'll say 73s to you, the pair of you, and uh, we'll catch up soon. 73, guys. 73. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. Now it's time to have a look at the news in brief for me, Colin, M6BOY. We start with news here that next Saturday on the 27th of April is MVIS Day. It will take place between 10am to 4pm Eastern Time. The purpose of MVIS Day is to construct and try various antenna ideas, all working as near vertical instant skywave antennas. Uh, which are antennas are low to the ground and provide coverage generally in a 400 mile radius, extremely important for regional HF communications in the event of an emergency. So we'll put uh, news uh, for this uh, event on our website, and as I say, uh, hopefully you're in the area, can uh, get involved, or maybe listen out to see if you can uh, hear what's going on by the, uh, the people taking part in that event. Now, your club, and if you're in the uh, US, can take part in the AWRL Foundation Club Grant Program. Uh, It's uh, returning for 2024. It's received additional funding from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Group. And there are grants uh, available. Uh, They've already given more than half a million dollars in grants to clubs across the uh, US. And uh, that helps transform the nature of the clubs and the people uh, taking part in our hobby. Uh, now, I say, anybody that's doing work in uh, the STEM group areas, etc., are uh, more than uh, welcome to take part and, I say, uh, put forward their proposals and, uh, as I say, uh, apply for the grant. Uh, there's a maximum of uh, $25,000, um, which includes reporting and media requirements available for each uh, person that submits. Uh, so, I say, it could be a good one to get involved in and, say, get some funding for your club. Now, in the UK, the Radio Communications Foundation, a small charity dedicated to encouraging people to take up radio as a hobby, uh, or in the case of youngsters, uh, promoting uh, a a RF-based career, are looking to recruit trustees. Um, So they're, uh, as I say, looking for applicants who have an interest in radio communications, be prepared to be involved in decision-making over grants, delivering uh, RCF projects, Radio Communication Foundation projects, and attracting charity funding. Uh, so we'll put a link uh, to that on the ICQ podcast webpage, and you can reach out to them if that's something you'd like to get involved in. Right now we're headed to our features episode, and it's a recap on ICQ Podcast Live, uh, put together by our friend and colleague, Ed Durant, DD5 Lima Papa. Hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. For this feature, what you are about to hear is a recording of the first ICQ live session that we had on the 13th of April. I had hoped for a better attendance from listeners. However, I'm not sure whether it was bad timing or whether the listeners who wished to 
access the talk group had problems doing so. If that was the case and you tried, please uh, take a look at the icqpodcast.com website for instructions or an easier way to access is using the smartphone app Droidstar. Uh, setting that up, for example, for Yesu Fusion is very straightforward indeed. I hope that uh, some of you can make the next one. Another point is, if you have never used digital voice, you will realise, listening to this recording, that the audio is not that easy to listen to. It's a little distorted, but after a while, you should get used to it. Thanks, and let's get on playing back what happened on the 13th. Hello, and welcome to the first ICQ live session on the ICQ Digital Talk Group channel. I'm Ed, DD5LP. We'll be trying to herd you cats, uh, if I can. First, some information. If you are new to digital voice, the audio may sound a little odd. To avoid too much distortion when talking, please avoid talking too loud or too close to the microphone. To allow for those accessing from Yesu Fusion or D-Star to get in, please leave three seconds before you press the PTT when someone else has finished their over I will monitor the Brandmeister website so that I can see who is on the talk group and invite in new callers in sequence. When you finish your over, please let me come in to ask the next person to speak. I'm recording this session for use as an ICQ feature, so by joining, you are given permission for your audio to be used on the show. So, who do we have? This is DD5LP listening. One, Mike Romeo Bravo. Good evening, Martin. Mike one, Mike Romeo Bravo. I've got you on the list as number one coming in. VK 6ADF. Good grief, Phil, you're still up. A VK 6ADF, DD5 LP, and uh, I'm guessing it's about two o'clock in the morning with you. Round to you, Phil, and then uh, we'll pass it back to Martin. Uh, VK 6ADF uh, with uh, M1 MRV on the side, DD5 LP. Yeah, okay. And. Uh, Good evening, uh, Ed, and uh, good evening, Martin, from VK6 ADF. Ah, three o'clock. You're almost right. <laughs> it's three o'clock. Three oh four at the moment. And no, I haven't been awake all the time. I haven't stayed up. I actually set my alarm. <laughs> so my alarm went off at uh, five two uh, three. <laughs> I'll put it back to you, uh, from VK6 ADF. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, VK6 ADF uh, with M1 MRB DD5 LP. Yep, okay, and uh, yeah, good on you to get up for for us at three o'clock in the morning there in uh, in West Australia. I'll push it over to Martin to say anything he wished to say, and then uh, I've got some prompt questions you might want to answer, Phil, or you might want to say something yourself. Um, first of all, over to Martin. M1 MRV with VK6 ADF. This is DD5 LP. DD5 LP, VK6 ADF. Uh, hi, Phil. And uh, good to hear you on. Um, yeah, Phil, um, I'll throw you a, a, a question and uh, answer it if you wish to, or uh, if you've got anything else to tell us. Uh, that would be great as well. Um, but I'd be interested in actually what got you into ham radio. Um, I know in my case it was through my brother who was in the Scouts. And through the Scouts he got into ham radio and uh, I sort of tagged along, found his interest was interesting and uh, got into the hobby myself. So, uh, Phil, what uh, what what got you into ham radio? Yeah, so, yeah good question. Such a long time ago. <laughs> well, starting it off. Late teens, and um, my parents had a shortwave radio. I used to tune around at night, listening to all the whistles and the squirks and the squeaks, and listening to uh, overseas uh, broadcast stations. I was an SWL without even knowing it. Uh, one night, I found uh, a BBC with broadcasting soccer match. Listening with great interest. So I was hooked as a, a shortwave listener. I used to listen to every Every weekend to the um, broadcast, uh, it, was, it, was, it was like in the early hours of the morning. Anyway, one, one day I was reading the news, reading the newspaper, and they were talking about CB radio. And uh, I looked at the uh, this shortwave radio thing, and I thought, oh, I might be able to listen to that. 
So I had a bit of a listen and I picked up somebody and uh, was listening with great interest. Anyway, after a while, I took this radio of mine in the car and uh, drove around until I was getting this, uh, this CB out. Really, really strong. I thought, it must be. <laughs> I was now doing the fox hunts without even knowing what it was. So I zoomed in on this person and uh, ended up introducing myself. And uh, he was a, uh, a CB who lived not too far away, a couple of streets away. So that, uh, that got me interested in CB. So I ended up buying a CB and uh, was on the CB for a couple of years. This was back in the days when the amateurs had the 11 meter band, being a, uh, in then days, pirate, so so called pirate. Yeah, I heard this uh, amateur who uh, also ended up not living too far away, talking on the 11 meters. And one day, he had a, a bad, really bad hum on his signal. He was saying to whoever he was talking to that he needed a, uh, a soldering iron that he didn't have at the time in order to uh, change a uh, capacitor on his power supply to stop the hum. And I, I basically, yeah, when he finished, I sort of went on and I said, well, I've got, a, I've got a soldering iron with me if you want. So he invited me around and I met him and uh, he was the first amateur I ever met. And from there... I got an interest in amateur radio, so I ended up buying the AWRL handbook, uh, reading it from cover to cover. I attended night school in the local uh, technical college when I was doing a radio course. I ended up with my novice license, which then ended up with the advanced license, and this was uh, 43 years ago. So um, that was how I got interested in radio. Uh, yeah, so very interesting, and I suspect your description of how you got in is probably reflects a lot of the listeners to ICQ. I was also involved in shortwave listening, of course, but back when I started, at that time in the UK, CB was not legal. came in a few years later, so uh, I got in through the legitimate way, through uh, the interest in shortwave, and then the fact that my brother was involved with the Scouts, and they had a uh, radio club, and um, that hooked me into the, uh, the amateur radio. Okay, so why don't we put the same question around to Martin, and he can tell us how... He got into amateur or ham radio. Yeah, no problem, sir. Well, I had to get into amateur radio. Well, I left school. I had, uh, I've been told this one many times. I left school, went to work for Philips in their television factory because I was interested in some radio and TV. Got eventually got qualified five years later as a TV radio guy, and I uh, was always interested in radio as well. I mean, my dad used to get upset because they used to bring the old, uh, old valve radios out of junk sales, and uh, he'd try and fix them. Then at stage 17, I went off to college, and dad joined me, and I got to know my father as a man rather than my father. I had a great time. My dad became a radio TV engineer, having spent at the age of 40 odd. Bear in mind, he'd been an absolutely brilliant carpenter up until then. We went off to the night school amateur radio thing after we'd done the radio TV stuff. And the guy teaching it was so disinterested that he put me right off. So I would have had a license around right about 1976. But unfortunately, I got me real amateur radio until 1999. Yeah, so in 1999, I was sit working for myself as a contractor, speaking to another contractor at lunchtime, and he says to me, why don't you take up amateur radio? Because uh, at that point in time, I just finished the hobby I was doing. I was looking for a new hobby, and... And he said, can we go on to radio? And I said, that's boring. He went, no, it isn't. And we sat there for an hour. And at the end of it, he said, well, he said, you know the technical stuff? You've got to do the licensing and a few other. So uh, anyway, I went off, did my exam. At that point in time, you could take um, your exam either at Christmas or uh, May. And uh, I started the course in uh, September. Took the exam at Christmas and passed. And but I enjoyed the guy who's teaching it so much, I completed the course. That's, it. That's how I got in. Yeah, okay, Martin. Yeah, thanks for the uh, theme for those. Interesting contrast that uh, you were actually trained in electronics and radios as your profession and then moved into the hobby, um, as opposed to, uh, I think, both Phil and myself started before we had professions effectively to, to get into the hobby. So, yeah, everything's possible, of course. I'll throw a new question around to Phil, see if we can uh, stump him with this one. Phil, what concerns or worries do you have in the amateur radio hobby 
Uh, just, you know, what's, what's the biggest problem for amateur radio today, in your opinion? Oh, good question. So many things to, to do and so little time to do it. I don't really have any concerns. I suppose uh, so in a couple of years I'll be saying lack of propagation. At the moment there's plenty around and uh, <laughs> cost of radios, maybe. Hopefully uh, we retain the bands that we've got and we don't lose any. Or uh, they don't put more uh, restrictions on the the uh, use of radio. Yeah. Okay. That was uh, interesting. That you're happy in the hobby. That's nice to hear, actually. And uh, I wonder if uh, Martin's got uh, a different uh, position on that. I mean, uh, I think the the point about licensing and access, etc. In the UK, of course, the licensing is uh, just. Uh, giving you a little bit more privilege, a bit more power as well, hasn't it, Martin? Anyway, let's see what you think. I'll ask you a question. I, um, <laughs> I have a different perspective to Phil, uh, which is because we can't all be the same. I think the hobby is suffering from a society issue of total apathy to do anything these days. It's really concerning me how, how few people will get involved and do anything. The classic is we've been trying, and we've got another two weeks to go, and I will do the eight sessions, we promise. But Smart Radio, you know, we've managed to negotiate a session at the library. We've put notices up, we've filled over the internet on it, a while now within the borough. And last session, nobody turned up, apart from my two helpers, you know. Um, there's a lot of apathy. Yes, I'm quite pleased with the way things that the new license are going. The power levels don't really affect me. I'm never going to really run more than 100 watts, if at all. So I'm not terribly worried about that. But I think it's a good bit of some of the other things they've done. And I'm still trying to remain positive. Although I am seeing a total lack of interest on a lot of people in the UK. You know, there's, there's far too many reasons why they can't buy it rather than they think they can't. And the other thing is, Colin wrote an article for uh, Rancom when it was in last uh, month's episode. And um, I, I'm waiting to see if we get any feedback in the letters page from that article. It'd be interesting. The apathy point is very valid, actually. I've just heard of another uh, ham fest that probably won't take place this year. Uh, it's actually not so much the apathy so much as uh, the people who uh, whose shoulders it falls on in the uh, in the club that runs this. They can't do it anymore. They're getting older, like I am. Um, it seems that uh, the younger people in the uh, the club, although they're interested in radio and they're interested in amateur radio, they're not you know not able to or not interested in or they're busy with families or profession or whatever. So the the kind of number of people that are actually going to be putting feet on the ground and organising, I guess any big event in this case a ham fest, is dwindling and and causing problems. And I've heard of that in a few clubs. I don't know if it's just apathy or it's ageing and the hectic society that we have these days, should we say the middle-aged people in the club who would normally take over the load from the older people simply can't because they're working so hard. Sad. Sad indeed. Another question. That question uh, to you, Phil, is what radio projects or actions have you got going at the moment to... Uh, as uh, another podcast would say, what's on your workbench, but it doesn't have to be something on the workbench. It might be a, a planned outing, an activation. It might be uh, anything to do with amateur radio. What What are you looking forward to doing in the next uh, month or so, or longer? Okay, um, projects. Yeah, so many. Where do, where do I begin? I don't have uh, my HF Yardie up at the moment because my tower is faulty. My tower consists of a it's an old lighting tower. Uh, which is uh, raised hydraulically. So my uh, antenna is usually uh, being raised and lowered by the hydraulics. And the hydraulics have failed. So I've got to... Well, I don't think I've got the equipment to, uh, to work on it because it needs a crane or something. So I've got to take it somewhere to get fixed. Before I do that, I've got to fix my uh, vehicle that tows it. So my uh, immediate projects... I don't know when it, when it will happen. I've got to get my car fixed. And then I've got to take the trailer somewhere to get uh, repaired so I can put the antenna on again and, uh, and raise and lower it to its uh, usual height, or uh, I've got to put up a new tower. So um, 
that's my uh, big pro- project for this uh, coming year, I suppose. I also want to put up a smaller mast, to, uh, some satellite antennas up. I've got the antennas ready to go across the Arctic, two and seventy centimetres, and I want to get to uh, get going on uh, on operating satellites. I've got uh, bits and pieces to make up a all-star node. So uh, that's a uh, few circuit uh, kits I, uh, I've accumulated. I've got to uh, solder them up and uh, get an, another all-star node operational. I think that's the, uh, the biggest uh, radio project that I've got uh, on, online at the moment. Yeah, OK, thanks for that, Phil. Yeah, so uh, obviously your uh, tower, your mast, is, uh, is mobile, and if it's on a trailer, that's actually quite handy. If it all works. Okay. Well, I'll push the same question around to uh, Martin. What what radio projects do you have going on? Interesting projects have got on the go. Well, Phil was partly to blame for this one. Hi, hi. Now, uh, in a nice way, Phil, um, you were going to let me have parks on the air last year, and I was going to try and do parks on the air last year. I never got out. But I did actually manage to act as a part this year already. So I uh, went out with Edmund a couple of weeks ago and managed to do some parks on the air. So that's what I plan to be doing more of. I managed to buy myself a Zygu G90. Lovely little radio. Um, ideal for taking it and doing that sort of thing, as you well know, Ed, because I know you've got one. And I do like injury with stuff. My little neighbour is a member of an off-roader club. They go off-roading and they have um, commercial two-way radios um, in their, their land trust. And two of them are not working and they've arrived at my house for to be looked at. And if I can fix it for him, I will. And I, I, do, I try and help where possible. So if I can fix it for him, I'll smile good. But, you know, generally... I'm planning to operate more this year, both on here, although that seems to be difficult at times, and going HF. Yeah, OK, Martin, thanks for that. Yeah, um, I got the, the feeling, uh, yeah, with you buying your new uh, portable radio that you can be going out uh, a lot more HF portable. Yeah, we might even get you to uh, get out of the parks and up onto a, a summit at some point, you never know. But yeah, that's probably the most major part of the hobby that I'm interested in, even though I have the luxury of living in a, a country village, so the interference levels here are uh, a lot less than there would be in a town or a city. It's still a world of a difference when you uh, can get out and work in the countryside, away from uh, uh, houses and traffic and everything else, and then effectively a little 20-watt uh, radio like the uh, Zyga or some of the others is magic. Yes, you can go with the 100-watt the version, of radios, but uh, then you need a bigger battery and they're heavier. But uh, whatever you've got is probably what you should start with. And yeah, it's great. It's a great part of the hobby. It's a part of the hobby that's still expanding. And coming back to my uh, worries about the hobby, you know, you hear a lot of people saying, oh, there's not enough youth coming into the hobby. We're all dying out. My opinion on that particular point is that we really should be looking at the, uh, the, the 40, 40 to 50 year old kind of people rather than any less than that adventure radio, if you like, I think is something that's uh, attracting a lot of people in the hobby to actually get on the air, uh, uh, combined with obviously the, the, the good propagation at the moment on the HF bands. I would love to pass over at this point to, to Edmund to see how propagation is on VHF because... Uh, I very rarely get on VHF or UHF. The last question I have here is one that perhaps we can ask Phil to respond to, save his question for whoever he wants to give it to. And the question is, do you have a question for one particular ICQ presenter, whether attending today or to be asked later, about any particular thing that you've got maybe a common interest with somebody in the the ICQ team? Mike Zero, Mike November Golf. Good evening and welcome, Edmund. So you, your ears must have been burning. Uh, we've just been saying that it's nice on HF bands and things. i um, wondering how VHF is. Uh, I actually will throw you the previous question, which is what projects or actions do you currently have on the go in, in the amateur radio field that the listeners might be uh, interested in? Thank you, Ed. I'll keep this short because I'm mindful I've got a rather flaky internet connection. The next thing... Coming up of note is the International Marconi Day on Saturday the 27th of 
April should be a good one this year because it's the 150th anniversary of the man's birth and uh, I know there will be quite a few special event stations on the air or club call signs on the air and uh, indeed some of the Italian ones are active already. Apart from that, I don't think there's anything coming up in the immediate next few weeks and as far as VHF goes, there's been quite good conditions today on tolls but I haven't been able to benefit from them because I've spent today watching the Irish GB AGM, going out shopping, mowing the lawn for the first time this year because of all the bad weather we've had and now taking part in, in this event this evening. Thanks for that, Edmund. Uh, yeah, my Coney Day is coming up, that's right. Um, I know you're uh, a keen supporter of both uh, of the activating side and the chasing side, and good luck to you with that. And it sounds like you've had a really full day today. Phil, do you have any hopes for the hobby itself, as in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, more, more people getting in, or more bands, more power? Do you, Phil, that's a good question, given that Australia's been trying to get the kilowatt allowance for some time for the advance licence, and also 60 metres. Are those things that you would be taking advantage of if the ACMA actually allowed 60 metres? I, I know there's other people on there at the moment, but I would have thought within Australia that could be actually a very useful band to have. Yes, high power would be, uh, would be nice. I've got an amplifier, which I've never used. Another, thing, another project I've got is to uh, reorganise the shack so it'll fit in there nicely. But uh, <coughs> yeah, I do have a 1K amplifier, so I would like to use it at some stage. The meters, uh, I don't think it'll ever happen. The, um, they, they've said in the past that uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's mainly used by the military. And the feeling he, he got was that uh, they're not interested in moving. I don't think uh, I don't think it'll ever happen. Not for not for a long, long time. So there's no point uh, looking forward to uh, 60 meters. I think. This is Katie to GMT uh, with the IQ podcast. What got you into ham radio, uh, Karen? Um, what's your history and what what got you into ham radio? I'm sure the uh, listeners will be interested. Ham radio was something I had wanted to first get into at the age of 12 here in the States. I grew up here in New York. Uh, and wanted to get my novice license, which at the time uh, seemed feasible for a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> Except uh, that never happened. I got distracted and never really followed up on it until after we had that famous storm, Superstorm Sandy, about uh, well, ten, 10 years ago, 10 years ago uh, this year, in fact. Um, and that's when uh, I realized it might be a good thing to go back and uh, and pick up where I left off. Uh, as it happened, I have an older brother who was a ham when I was growing up, and uh, he left license laps. He retested, so I chose that as the year to retest, well, not to retest, to test as well. Um, got my technician and then got my general, and that's where I am for the moment. No regrets. I just wish I'd done it sooner, but I'm fairly active. I do POTA. I do CW a lot. I do special events, which are uh, an important thing for me, particularly if we have a humanitarian cause. And I love Ragshu. <laughs> so here I am, uh, doing Ragshu on, on DMR. There's so much here. There's so much here. I can't imagine anyone getting their life and being bored. That's it in a nutshell for me. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Karen. Yeah, I'm going to throw it around to Edmund, and you can exchange stories if you have any about special event stations, Edmund. As you, as you just heard from Karen, it's something she's involved with, uh, Mike's getting involved with as well. Um, but we know from the uh, the podcast, Edmund, that it's also something that you were uh, are a, a big uh, participant in. Thank you, Ed. You asked earlier on, where amateur radio adventures started, how I got into it, and that's rather lost in the mists of time. I don't remember. I certainly didn't have any family members or neighbours or friends who were doing it, but I'm 80% sure that I discovered amateur radio at Amberley Museum, where there was and is still a permanent special events station. And I think that was in the early 1990s when I was 
13, 14, 15 years old. And if you had said to me back then that 25 years later I would be the licence holder for the special event station and the club call sign there, I would probably have laughed. But in a roundabout way, it's a, a good example of why I would always encourage people to upgrade their licence if they have that possibility. Because when I was, before I got my full licence, I thought that the main things I would value it for would be the right to transmit on 60 metres, 5 megahertz, and to operate in France on the occasions I visited there on holiday on 2 metres to talk to the locals. In fact, those privileges are not the privileges that I've really used and valued it for. What I've valued the full license for, above all, is the ability to hold a club call sign and to hold a notice of variation for special event stations. So I would always encourage people to upgrade their license, not for the reasons that they think they want to do it, but for the completely different reasons that today probably haven't even crossed their mind, as it didn't in my case, but to actually use it for things and value it that today they haven't even imagined. It makes a lot of sense, Edmund. It's one of those things where history comes around, so to speak, with you first seeing amateur radio at the museum there and then ending up being one of the key people behind the radio station there. We'll push it around to Martin again, see if he's got anything to ask or to, to add. Then we've got another couple of questions for the Karen to uh, see what we go with those. Okay, over to you, Martin. Yeah, hi, Well, I said quite a bit because in fairness, I think most people have heard me as I'm on pretty much on every podcast. So, uh, you know, I'll let you guys have a better go at this. I will say a couple of things. Hi to Karen. Glad you made it. And good to work you again on the GMR. You're a busy person. One other thing is, I will be with Evan uh, on Marconi Day. So, Evan and I are playing uh, an operating on Marconi Day. So, I'll be with him on that day. So, uh, that's pretty much it for me, Ed. So, back to you. Yeah, okay, Martin. And um, talking about special event stations, I actually will be taking part in one in August. It's a special event station for animal protection and dog protection in general. I believe Karen's going to also be taking part in this. I'm going to be submitting my request to BNET today, next month, if you're not allowed to uh, ask for it uh, until it's three months before, to get a, uh, a special dog call sign. So, yeah, that's probably the first special event station I've ever taken part in, and we'll see how it goes from my side. Okay, and um, the next question over to you, Karen, and then off, the, off my little list here. What concerns or worries do you have in the amateur radio hobby, uh, either you know, concerns that affect you directly and, and the things you do or in the hobby in general. Well, I was not the Phil first of VK6 ADF. Thank you for your greetings. <laughs> Thank you for staying up and having yourself asleep to be with us. And big shout out uh, to Edmund and to Martin as well. Thank you, Ed. Great question. Uh, and Ed, I, I so appreciate we will be international teammates in uh, August with the special event station here in the States, Kilo to Delta, Kilo to Dog. I do have concerns. I have great concerns about, about this hobby. One is, is, I guess it's always existed. Maybe I did not notice for all the years that I was not yet a ham, is a lack of, an increasing lack of civility on the air. Uh, an increasing lack of, of tolerance that uh, many of us have for one another. And I, I don't know what, what this is a byproduct of, whether it is just a reflection of so-called civilization in nature, that people are increasingly intolerant of one another, but there just seems to be less of that on the air from personal, from an interpersonal standpoint. And I think uh, ham radio is a medium of acceptance. It should be. It's a medium of communication and bringing people together. And as such, that part of it, uh, I hear a lot of old-timers claiming that it certainly has gotten worse in recent years. 
So on that count, that, that's a concern of mine. And I guess coupled with that is a desire to retain, for lack of a better word, the legacy methods of operating even as we move toward the digital era. Uh, the technology is really taking us places that no one could conceive of decades ago. Uh, I'd like to see everybody peacefully coexist. Certainly, we aren't tripping over one another, although I do have to say when I'm operating CW, hearing digital QRM is a bit troubling. But you know what? There's always been QRM. It doesn't matter what mode it is. There's always been that thing happening. So uh, that's less of a worry. But I would like to see every mode that people want uh, to be supported and to continue going forward so that people who want the more traditional means in the hobby can pursue that, and people who are the experimenters and the folks in the band can also continue. I think there just needs to be greater acceptance all around of the spirit of experimentation and the ham radio tradition of giving a nod to history. So, that, that's really my main concerns. Those are my main concerns, Ed. And uh, they're very broad, but I think they, they permeate every corner of the hobby. That's right. Another question for everybody. Which part of the hobby, and we know this is a hobby with a hundred hobbies within it, or some people say a thousand, which part of the hobby have you not tried yet and you would like to try? Yeah, one example might be I haven't done anything with satellites, or I haven't done CW, or I haven't done digital modes, I haven't done slow scan TV, whatever. Is there a particular part of the hobby that you have read about and are interested in, but haven't ever found the time to get to and still would like to? I'll start with Martin on that one. Interesting question, Ed. Is any that I have not tried or want to try that I haven't tried? Maybe things like Whisper, I'm not played with that. But invariably, as you well know, I don't do Morse. My brain just doesn't do it. And we can argue very long that I could know how to do it, and there's some pieces. I'm a very busy person. I'm on the go all the time, and I relax. I fall asleep. You know, I sit there listening to and it'll put me to sleep within five minutes, I guarantee you guys, so I apologise. But it doesn't mean to say that I'm not interested. You know, I spent a lot of time with the general public, as everyone will tell you, when we were out operating the other week. I was a fair amount of time with the general public. I'm able to convert on these things within amateur radio, and I've looked at them, and even if I haven't tried them, they at least don't even have a look at these things, which allows me to... At least answer questions for people uh, if they need it. So most of all, you know, I, I enjoy or do anyway. Yep. Okay, Matt. Uh, yeah, I'll push that same question straight around uh, down to uh, down to Phil in uh, Western Australia. There is there a part of the hobby that you've uh, read about and uh, would like to get involved with and have never had the time? Something on the bucket list, one could say. Well, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but I am fortunate that I've dabbled with most things, except maybe microwave. Never tried. I, I can get on 1296, but I've never actually transmitted. Got the radio, so I don't know. There is very, very little microwave over this side of the world. I don't know if I'd want to do it, but it's, uh, yeah, if it's there, I'll, I'll give it a go. But there's nobody to uh, transmit to around here. I've done lots of digital. The entire year after I got my uh, full license, I did nothing but CW. I totally enjoyed it. And then basically never touched it again since. So I'm slowly trying to get my speed back up in CW receiving. So I'd like to do a bit more CW. Again, uh, you know, another project for retirement. Hi, hi. I've done satellites and looking at uh, getting back into them again. I wouldn't mind you know, trying to get into uh, VARA digital mode. Got it installed. I've, I have used it, but very, very few stations that I can actually you know, work from here. It's a thing that I'll keep on dabbling with, but can't seem to get interested. Yeah, I'm not much into contests, so that, uh, that doesn't interest me at all, as Martin knows. When we get on talking with <laughs> to uh, rank you and uh, yeah, things go haywire. So I do like uh, rank chewing. I think most concepts in, in the amateur hobby I have dabbled with or uh, experimented with all the digital modes and uh, things modes. Just can't get into contests at all. <laughs> I want to get back in, um, get more into parks, but uh, not POTA, as it's known as. I'm into the VKFF, which is the uh, worldwide flora and fauna. 
which is a slightly different to poker, but it results in the same. Get out in the national parks and enjoy the inside highway. Special events stations, yeah, I'll be down one in, in August as well. The Lighthouse weekend, I uh, always look forward to that. So that will be my event station for the year. Anyway, back to you then. OK, I'll push the same question around to uh, to Edmund now. Uh, any part of the hobby that you'd like to get into, but so far haven't been able to? Well, in no particular order, 472 kHz, 23 fans, fast-scan TV, satellite, QO100, mastering CW, parks on the air, and probably other things as well. Parks on the air is something I should do, really. I live less than two miles outside of the South Downs National Park. Um, my local hill, High Down Hill, is just within the boundary, and I, I've walked there and back from home in the past, so I really should do poker parks on the air. Did my first one with Martin as part of the, uh, the 433 Alive event designed to get some activity on 70 centimetres and I'm sure I'll be doing that again. Incidentally, the next 433 Alive, if you like that sort of thing, is cancelled in for Saturday the 29th of June. Um, if I haven't got the, the date exactly right, it's the last Saturday in June anyway. There's another 145 Alive coming up on Saturday the 11th of May and the 11th and 12th of May is Mills on the Air weekend so hopefully some windmill stations will be able to combine both those events together for obvious reasons windmills are usually quite well placed in terms of height and that also goes well on two metres of course yeah, OK, I'll point from, from everybody so far anyway, and I'll push it straight over to Karen, so we continue with the same question, which is, is there a part of the hobby that you'd like to get into, that you've read about, or you've seen other people doing, but so far haven't had time, and it's something that you'd like to try? Yes, absolutely, Ed. I've, I've been filling my pocket. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, originally it was with CW. I decided I would go back to that, which I did two years ago. Uh, I had learned it at age 12, uh, but really needed to learn it so I could use it. Uh, then my obsession became Boga, really operating portable, operating outside anywhere. Boga just happened to be a, a convenient means, which I'm now obsessed with. And I've been doing that a year and a half now, <clears throat> what I'd really like to do, and it's been in the back of my mind, uh, I don't have the time for it now, but it's there, and I'll get to it. I would really like to get involved in something like Skywarn and weather reporting, uh, severe weather conditions, helping out in weather emergencies uh, by giving real-time reports and assisting in that. I think that's a a really very high purpose of amateur radio. Much of the stuff I do while I did public service and I have assisted in the past at uh, marathons and, and activities and, and done public safety events with my club in years past. I think doing something along the lines of weather spotting, especially now the weather's getting so weird. Uh, the weather is just and I, I think the, the role of the amateur is going to be gain increasing importance in, in the years to come with the weather getting so freaky. Also, I think at heart, many of us are weather geeks. We like the weather. We talk about the weather. The weather is part of some of the formula exchanges that we have when we get on the air. So my bucket is not yet full, and I think the next thing to go into the bucket, maybe it'll be a rain bucket, I suppose, <laughs> will be uh, to become more active in amateur radio with respect to weather related activities. Back to you, Ed. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, weather spotting was something that I hadn't even thought about. I mean, I've heard about Sky One and everything else in the US, but I wonder if that's a, just a US thing. I don't know of it actually going on in Europe at all. And if somebody uh, finds out about that and I'm completely wrong, then obviously let us know. So, uh, yeah, I can see uh, you're quite right. It's something that will grow in importance to uh, everything that's happening at the moment. From my point of view, answering the same question, I'm a similar situation to Phil, where I've dabbled in a bit about everything around uh, 
amateur radio that I can think of. I've even been on a de expedition on the de expedition side of it, in other words, the other end. I've done contesting. I actually did. When I first got into the hobby, I did a VHF, UHF, SHF contesting with the local club. I can understand the thrill people get from contesting, but unfortunately, being a possible operator for SOTA, HEMA, HOTA, and whatever else, at a weekend, we can, or I can just about forget here in Europe, forget trying to go out and uh, an activity because of the number of, uh, shall we say, wannabe contest stations on who are over-modulating and, and over-wide, over-dragging the amps etc. and making it uh, difficult for other people to communicate. Not a big fan of HF contest, although I do understand the thrill they get from it. Can't remember, was it, uh, was it you, Edmund, that you mentioned the QO100 and, and, and microwaves? I've actually operated back in the 80s on 1296 on FM, tripling the carrier from 432 and working, uh, where did I work from? Work from Yorkshire down into Norfolk. So not a long way, but I did that a couple of times and uh, also during contests, we used to operate 1296 as well. But QO100 is interesting, something I would actually like to do, because it's one of these satellites that is a, uh, a transponder, not just a single channel. So effectively, it's another amateur band in some ways. Um, with the proposal going around of getting a second geostationary satellite up at some point, over the uh, North Atlantic would be ideally located here in in Central Europe to use QO100 for part of the world and the other uh, ESA satellite for the other part of the world. So and they all use microwaves for the up and down links for those. So combination of microwave and satellite that's something I haven't done. Yeah, I think at the moment my, my big interest is in portable operating, um, building and improving antennas for portable operating off of home. I'm getting uh, a lot of a lot of enjoyment out of that, so I shouldn't complain, especially with the good HF propagation at the moment. Okay, so I'm now going to wrap things up. Yeah, time is this, Ed. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for running it. Uh, enjoy the listening. There's a chat to you, as I always do. And uh, for any of our listeners that didn't, and our guys, we know by. If you hear full of me having a marathon session, we can go in excess of three hours. You're still welcome to join us. Phil and I love talking to you. My business there, uh, Ed. I'll leave it to, to you to close up. Yeah, yeah, and I'll pass it straight over to Phil. For any uh, any final comments for us, go ahead. And my previous... Uh over, I forgot to say uh, hello to uh, Edmund. <laughs> so, uh, hello Edmund, long time though here. Well, I've heard you plenty of times, but a long time before since I uh, heard you on this one. Yeah, okay, thanks for uh, running this, uh, Ed. It's been fun. Thanks for uh, running it, and uh, seven threes to all the uh, people on the channel at the moment. Thanks for attending, Phil. Setting your alarm and getting up in the middle of the night to take part in this event was uh, sterling work from you. Thank you very much, really appreciate that. Okay, round to Edmund. Any any final comments at all um, before we uh, close everything up? Well, I'm, I'm just amazed that my internet connection appears to have held up throughout this whole session because I was certain it wasn't going to. I was just reflecting on what I've been doing recently and as has been mentioned, amateur radio isn't just one hobby. There's many, many different hobbies within. So within the last few weeks, I've been playing on 70 centimetres FM simplex with Martin. Then earlier this week, just gone past, been transmitting Whisper on 15 metres, coincided with the solar eclipse in America to see if the eclipse will have an effect on propagation on the second or third hops on that band. Then today, have been watching the RSGB the AGM annual general meeting online tonight, taking part in, in this event on the ICQ podcast talk group. Um, I'm transmitting and using the DMR and the hotspot. Tomorrow, I might go on 40 metres and hunt out some special event stations. There are a few on the air in connection with International Marconi Day already. There are others still for the old Amateur Radio Day, which I think from memory is the 18th of April. And there's also quite a few special event stations from Spain on the air at the moment that start Alpha Oscar 75 to celebrate 75 years of the URE, which is the Spanish equivalent of the RSGB. So just when you think you've done everything there is to do, there's, there's more, yet more hobbies within the hobby. Have a good evening, everybody, and uh, take care.
Yeah, thanks, Edmund. And you just underlined uh, a good fact there, where people come back and say, nothing ever happens in ham radio. You've just spent, what, two, three minutes listing off things that have been happening or are happening within three days in amateur radio. So thanks for that, Edmund. That was actually a very illuminative, uh, illuminating, that's the word, list of a variety of things in the hobby that everybody can actually take part in. Thanks again. And Karen, this time not ladies first, but ladies last. Sorry about that. Have you, have you got anything to say to, to close out? Over to you. Just wanted to say this is in a great uh, group, RACU, ICQ Podcast Net, whatever you might call it, a free for all. <laughs> I wish we could have more of these in spite of the DMR issues we've been having. Uh, this was fantastic. And I so appreciate Phil setting his alarm to join us. That really made it extra special. Yes, there's so much to do in ham radio. This is one of those things, getting together and, and talking about what we love to do, knowing that each one of us may say different things that we love to do, but we are all amateur radio operators nonetheless. I think that's the unifying factor. Always good to remember that. So, um, Ed, thank you for corralling us and, and giving us this opportunity to speak to one another in this casual way and to share a lot of good thoughts. I will turn it back to you and to our listeners. I say thank you very much. And, of course, to members of the ICC podcast team, I thank you very much. Great opportunity, great fun. Let's do it again sometime. Uh, I'll say seven three and turn it back over. Yep, yeah, thanks for that, Karen. And uh, again, thanks for everybody who who was able to attend. We were hoping for uh, a few more, but obviously things got in the way with the technical or uh, commitments. And we always said it's always it's family and life first and then the hobby later. Thanks to all of you online at the moment and to all the listeners. All the best and enjoy the hobby. Uh, 73 from me uh, to uh, everybody on the group here and to the listeners. This is DD5LP now closing and going QRT. Cheerio all. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. Well, everybody, uh, thank you there for listening to episode 428 of the ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast. Really hope you've enjoyed our episode uh, this uh, uh, this fortnight. Uh, as always, we'd like to thank our annual and uh, monthly subscription donors who say give us a wonderful base to help us pay our way. And those donations, along with Pete Leng, Zulu Lima 4, Tanga Echo, I say have uh, helped us, I say, out and uh, done uh, a bit to, I say, keep your show for your advert free. You can uh, show your value you got from the show by visiting icqpodcast.com forward slash donate, where we'll say everything that comes our way to show your value in the show, we pop back into the show as well and pay its way, so keep it advert free, etc. for you. So uh, please do consider us. Thanks to Ed Durant, DD5 Lima Papa, for producing the uh, episode feature for us on ICQ Podcast Live. And thanks to Dan, KB6, Nevermore Uniform, Karen, KD2, Golf Uniform Tango, and Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike Nevermore Golf, for joining Martin and my MRB in the News Roundtable. All right, well, that wraps up uh, this episode's show. It's episode 428 of the ICQ Podcast. We hope you continue to enjoy the hobby, and we'll catch up again in a fortnight's time. 73's on. <laughs>